It's so absolutely great to see you. Um, now, first of all, what I'd like to say to everybody, you can't see everybody. This is a new system we are testing for our program, Thrive. And uh, this is a big difference. Uh, well, it's a Zoom, but a big different system to, to normal Zooms, uh, allowing for a large number of participants. Uh, but we are a little bit nervous because we don't know yet this system and we are learning. So the first good starting point is that we can see you. But I'm still not sure why we see uh, the on the whole screen uh, in a big screen uh, Fabian, but uh, not not me. I'm talking or not Susanna. That sounds Susanna. like I, yeah. I, I can't explain why. why. I can see you. I can hear you. In yeah. Oh, no, okay. Now now we can see. You. All right. <laughs> um, well, it's um, it's a formal and informal. We are trying to make it formal in that sense that we are preparing for a sort of big participants and uh, but informal that after all this is our research group. So um, uh, so in that sense, it's not like we are we are talking to hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's absolutely great, great to see you. And it's the first time we see each other uh, since we parted uh, in Paris. And I'll get to this in a moment. So let me uh, start um, and I'll have a little presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. So welcome everybody to this uh, well new it's not the first that we are uh, giving a uh, webinar, Stripe webinar, but it's, it's the first time we are using this with our logo and with all the uh, presentation uh, new uh, um, system which we have. So this this is the title and this is our speaker, uh, speaker Professor Susanna uh, uh, Nunes. So what I'd like to do first, as we always do, I'd like to um, make an acknowledgement of traditional owners. We acknowledge the Tuval and Yulara as the first nations people of the land where right now stands. We acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the Thrive community. So with this, it's our presenter and our presenter on this photo looks uh, similar to the presenter uh, we can see on the screen. Uh, we share lots with Susanna, uh, as we've learned uh, during that week we spent together in Paris in June. And I think we also uh, like similar colors. Today I'm, uh, I'm sort of unusually in yellow, but red is usually my color as well. Um, there's a lot what I could say about Susanna, and I, I think there are at least two slides of this. So I just say a few words from uh, what it is here, and then uh, like uh, Susanna to um, perhaps in, tell more about your um, career. So Susanna is the Vice Provost for Faculty and Academic Affairs at KAUST, where she's a Professor of Chemical and Environmental Science and Engineering. She has a PhD in chemistry from the University of Campinas, Brazil, was a Humboldt postdoc fellow uh, in polymer physics uh, chemistry at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz in Germany, in Germany and business scientist at the Max Planck for polymer science at Tokyo Institute of Technology. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry UK and the Sao Paulo Academy of Science in Brazil. Now, very importantly, Susanna is uh, the laureate of the 2023 uh, Laureate UNESCO for Women in Science International Award for Africa and the Arab States, uh, recog recognized for her achievements in chemistry. Now, this is when Susanna and I uh, met and uh, listening to Susanna's presentation to the uh, um, Academy uh, of uh, Science, French Academy of Science, about the chemistry, amazing chemistry she uh, designs works on. And I realized that how many links of between what Susanna does exist to what we do. Initially, I listened at something well very distant to, uh, to my area of knowledge and said that, well, no, this is so interesting and so much related. So that's why I thought We'll invite Susanna to tell us more about this, how it can link to what we are doing, and perhaps to see whether in the future we can have some collaborative links with Stripe. 
as I said, there's more in this and I'm not going to read this. There wasn't in, in the announcement. And if there's anything, Susanna, you'd like to say more about yourself, then please do this in your presentation. So I'll stop uh, sharing my screen. Thank you very much for agreeing to give this presentation, Susanna, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lily. It's, it's really great pleasure to to talk to you, to meet you again, even if it's uh, online. It, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll meet again soon. Maybe he had cows. Let me see if I'm sharing the... Uh, are, are you seeing my slides? You can see it. it's just just not in the presentation mode yet. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Start. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, and very kind of you, the introduction and everything. But in, in, I see we have a lot of uh, um, in common interests or values, uh, even though we are a bit in different areas. So, but uh, I, I will show um, a summary of what we are, have been doing here at Chaos. And uh, uh, maybe we find uh, ways to collaborate in the future. So my my work is uh, on on main brands. Uh, it's, it's mainly material science, uh, uh, development of uh, polymers and develop and using these polymers to prepare filters that could be filters for air, but could be in, in great part for liquids for uh, purification, separation of uh, challenge uh, process. So let me give you some examples, and I will go here. Let's see here, yeah. So let's show this picture that you know as well as I know is a picture that uh, was taken in during our visit in, in Paris uh, in the uh, city of science. And I like this picture because show very well the uh, how climate uh, warming is uh, happening. And this is, uh, I think uh, by now everybody knows that and knows the consequence. And, and this question is, what can we do? How can we contribute to stop that, or at least to to minimize the consequence? And if you see here, uh, it's we talk a lot about uh, carbon capture. Most everybody talks about carbon capture, but it's uh, um, it, it's much more complex than that in the way that we we can act. Uh, and uh, if we see the the report of the IPCC this year uh, and this um, distribution of what each of the sectors uh, are contributing for CO2 emission and energy consumption, which are tightly linked. Uh, you see energy is uh, certainly the, the biggest one. Of course, we have to, to invest on renewals, renewables and uh, and change, uh, not use the fossil fuels anymore. But industry is also a big player and uh, in different ways. First, because it uses fossil fuels, but not only. So I think most of what we use today uh, use a series of, uh, of uh, purification steps, of separation steps that are complex and they uh, they are needed. We will not get the, the products if we not uh, go through all this process. And this is a, a where I work most. I worked in the past on on uh, fuel cell for transportation. Uh, have not been working as much as as before. Um, more in in the separations that could be used for for the industry. And building a small part. And in so you you see also this picture here on the right side that is probably very familiar for you who live in, in Queensland because oh, this is a coral reef. It's not a, a great barrier reef, but it's a reef just outside uh, Kaos where I live. So it's an hour from here in the north. And there's a picture that was taken by my son, who is a marine uh, scientist and student, PhD student. It looks very nice, um, but is if you know more about the system, it's very sad because if you see these colors, if you see the white, the lila, the the blue on the coral reef, is because they are about to die. And this uh, picture that uh, was taken about a week ago, 
And uh, until now, this was one of the most, the nicest uh, reef very close here. So we all know, you know better than 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 most because it's uh, affecting uh, Australia, uh, one of the, the most, the nicest part of Australia. So it's not only because of that, we need to, to act as soon as possible. And if we continue with the report, uh, you see how the different um, different uh, sectors would have to, or have the perspective of uh, of decreasing or, or reducing the increase of uh, of temperature if we act. So and transport industry building. Uh, so maybe the perspective is is less or needs to be less than than energy but we need to do a lot. And I like very much this plot on the right side because it shows what are the real perspective of uh, uh, acting or having an effect if we act. So um, the mitigation options. And I think it's not surprising that solar and wind, uh, if we could invest on that, is, is a, we have a very large impact. But what I think, for which for me is not surprising, but what most forget or, or don't realize, let's say, is that the simple carbon capture is the one with the less, the minor effect. And if you see the colors here, if you have a, a very strong red or dark red, is the most expensive one. So, it's not that we should not be doing, everything needs to be done. It's only that we should not forget other options and we need to uh, act in different fronts. It's not only about carbon capture. When we come to carbon capture, it's almost too late. So it's one part of the story. Um, it, it, this is a picture here that I show also in my talk in, in, in Paris. It's, a, it's from the UN. Uh, it's a summary of uh, everywhere where energy or CO2 are produced. Uh, like uh, on the top here, I don't know if you see my course, so it's uh, more the energy connected and uh, and here is the, the user of, uh, uh, of energy. So like buildings of transport uh, industry. And in the, my career I have been working in different ways in, related to that. So uh, CO2 separation, because we develop membranes for, for gas separation. Fuel cell develop membranes for polymeric fuel cell, which are um, uh, really used or cars, so it, at least it's a plan to use in cars. I think the batteries have by now been more uh, implemented than fuel cell, but this is a part of the story. Um, and dehumidifier. We have been working quite a lot in the last few years on uh, membrane dehumidifiers for air conditioning, which is also has a air conditioning have a one of the strongest uh, consumption of energy and fractionations in the industry. So here I summarize um, how I see that membranes could be used uh, in this transition and on the way to to secure a, a, a future with the, which is uh, with less uh, CO2. So we, we want to have a, a future with the green hydrogen, with solar, with the, uh, everything in industry, super effective, process integrated one, um, zero waste uh, recycling, everything um, perfect. But is this not, we are still far from that. We we need a transition, and this transition will might be um, several years where uh, we'll still be using fossil fuels. We we'll still be um, using producing, so using industry to produce um, different polymers, plastics, uh, uh, chemicals, pharmaceuticals that that need to be more effective. So 50% of energy in chemical and petrochemical industry is used for 
separations in the, in some form, distillation, but not only distillation, a lot of, uh, of different uh, methodologies. If we could reduce that, if we could use uh, distillation, use a lot of energy because use a lot of heating. If we could use other methodology like membrane technology, some of them at least uh, integrate to the process or substitute part of them. So then we use uh, uh, less energy, it produce less CO2. Um, yes, and mainly uh, the, the industry, the largest produced of, uh, of, an, of CO2 are chemical and petrochemical. And we cannot just get rid of them. We, we if we stop the chemical industry, we we stop everything that we consume today. So membranes have been very effective in separation, in especially in desalination. So here I live in in Saudi Arabia today, and uh, practically, so for sure the the water that we have, we have a a campus which is a. a a city as well, so it's uh, practically every all students and professors and and staff they live on campus. They are about an hour from the a big city of Jeddah, uh, so that means all the water that we use are uh, desalinated water from sea water, and we use membrane. We have a big uh, facilities for for membrane desalination, and desalination by membranes is. Uh, a uh, great part uh, of the process used for in Saudi Arabia, the whole country. There are still part which is a thermal desalination, but more and more are being substituted by, by membrane process. So my, my research is uh, what else can we do with membranes? So a separation with, uh, for desalination is very established, is uh, implemented by uh, not only in, in Saudi Arabia, by all countries in the Middle East, but also in Spain, other countries that have a, a scarcity of water. So what can we do for other kinds of separations? More challenge. Challenge because uh, then we will not be using these membranes with water. We will be using with solvents, with using with uh, uh, higher temperature, with uh, environments that can uh, destroy the membrane itself if we don't choose the right ones. And there are many ways to prepare membranes. Some are really easy to scale up, uh, use in the industry. Um, some are, are more uh, like uh, still on a very early stage of development. So the largest, uh, the most common one is what we call non-solvent induced phase separation, which is, uh, uh, I can show uh, a little bit how, how it is produced, how, uh, but it's mainly a solution process. So you, you take a polymer, you dissolve it, and then uh, you, you use as a coating or a kind of a process which is based on, on dissolution. This itself is something that we need to improve because a lot of of solvent is also a, a, a can be a pollutant, can be a, a needs to be recycled and so on. But this is the main process of membrane preparation. And then we have, especially for desalination, what we call interfacial polymerization. I will show you some examples. And there are there are other ways, like some uh, still quite new ways, like nanofabrication. So here you will see um, a process that is uh, hollow fiber preparation. Hollow fibers are, uh, you can see here on the, on the left side, uh, a cut, a cross section of a fiber. And you see on the right, a machine in our lab and producing how they produce. You just inject a solution of a, a polymeric solution of, uh, and then you in inject through a, a spinneret so like an extruder, and then you you collect that in water, and when it comes to water, it coagulates. It has a I don't have time to go in detail, but it's a, a phase separation process, and you have the formation of uh, pores like you see in the right side. So 
uh, in the left side. In the left side, you see uh, in the microscope uh, how the this this membrane look like. And when you see this uh, module, which is uh, this cylinder with a lot of fibers, uh, a typical cylinder like a module of hollow fiber might have a thousand of, of fibers together. This is exactly the same kind of module that is used for artificial kidney. So all machines for artificial kidney, they have this kind of models. Of course, it's a quite different uh, material. It's a different, um, might be a different preparation in terms of details, but the, the, the principle is the same. And this can be used also for gas separation and for uh, dehumidification. So we are part of the work that we are doing now, and I think it fits more uh, the, the indoor air um, quality that you, you work with is uh, uh, the air condition itself and the dehumidification de and filtration of, of air. Um, so especially in the region where I'm living now, so air conditioning is responsible for one of the largest part of the energy consumption is uh, um, we constantly need to to live with a, a cooling system. Temperatures in summer can reach far above 40 degrees, maybe a little bit less here that we are on, on the seaside, but in the middle of the of Saudi Arabia is, is uh, summer is very hot. And uh, um, part of the air conditioning is uh, also the dehumidification. Areas like where I live now, in tropical areas as well, or they are uh, they are very humid, and the the cooling itself with a large uh, content of water will cost you even more energy. So if if we have a, a we, we need first to reduce the humidity, which could be like uh, up to almost 90% in some days, um, especially this time of the year, summer or so here. Uh, but it's the same in other parts of the world where it's more tropical or if it's more like uh, go to Florida or places like that, which are very humid. Uh, and the idea is always first, you have to, to reduce the humidity and then you work with the uh, temperature decrease as well. Uh, the different ways to do that, and uh, each way has a, a different uh, efficiency in terms of uh, of energy. So it's uh, usually you measure, but which is called COP, which is a uh, you measure what's the the heating or cooling effect effectivity effectivity of uh, efficiency uh, divided by the work that you use to reach that um, that result. So. Membrane. What we are doing now is about two, which is, is a good value. If if you see in these slides, also you see on the left side, uh, like a diagram or like a de depicting the uh, what a fiber. What is what is the idea? So the fibers that I show in the previous slide, you could uh, use uh, like a um, you could have. In internally, so it's a hollow fiber. That means they, in the middle of this uh, fiber, um, you could circulate a, a desiccant, or you could uh, apply vacuum, or you could uh, circulate um, dry air or dry nitrogen. And uh, outside, you could uh, you have your air, or or other way around, depending on on the, the design of your system. And then you can have uh, all these fibers integrated in the module, the same module that I show you with a similar to the artificial kidney. And then several of these modules you can collect and, and set together. Uh, and they, the fact that they are mod modular, you can increase the number of, uh, of these uh, setups uh, depending on, on the size of your building or the size of of the system you want to, to dehumidify. 
So this is a kind of thing that we can do in our lab in a more translational form uh, where we um, prepare the fibers. We can even prepare uh, different polymers, new ones. Uh, these fibers usually are coated by a thin layer of a, of a more special material that is uh, more effective to, to, to take the water out of the air. Uh, so then uh, what we see in the middle is when you have the fibers uh, integrated in, in these modules, they are, um, um, so we, we have to seal. There's a, there's a very technical um, process where you, you have to glue the, the, the fibers all together as you use a kind of centrifuge. And then we, we have the coating machine here as well. We tried different materials to see which one is the most effective in terms of, of reducing the, the water from the taking the water out of the air. It has to be a very permeable material, very fast, but has to be very effective and selective. So we have been working with uh, more, I say, copolymers. These are commercial copolymers, but are, uh, so you see materials that form kind of channels so one channel more hydrophilic that will take the water out and others more hydrophobic that will give the, the mechanical uh, stability to these coatings, like guiding, driving the transport of, a, of water through, through these membranes. Uh, we have been using more here where it's written capsule. Uh, we have a... Um, the, the transport of water or how effective these layers are for, for separating water from, from the environment uh, depends on, on how um, hydrophilic, how, how much is the sorption of water. So, but if it's served too, too much, the water, usually the, uh, it, it will be something that swells and, and it's not a, uh, mechanically stable anymore. So we one of our approaches is to use um, porous uh, carbon capsules, which are uh, which include liquids like um, so special liquids that are very uh, hydrophilic or absorbed uh, water very much. Like uh, you have a series of uh, possibilities. Some are natural uh, liquids like uh, uh, kind of ionic liquids. Or what we have been done less is a, a coating which is more a biopolymer coating. Uh, then we we can be more sustainable, more uh, but have also very effective. They are very um, have a lot of uh, hydroxy groups. They are very uh, hydrophilic and easy to coat. We have we have to cross link them to give more stability and so on. So these values, I don't know how much they, they tell you something, but it's a, uh, this 13, what we, GPU is the permeance, how fast the water will go through this uh, this material. These are quite high values uh, that uh, we, we now achieved with uh, uh, some of the materials that we are working with. So this for, um, for the dehumidification, and these modules can be used for uh, buildings. We have a pro, uh, um, it's like a pilot uh, project at CAUS inside. Since we, as I mentioned, we are a city, we can um, test like having a smart house or having a, a house where uh, we test a new approach for uh, air conditioning. So working with colleagues, uh, which are mechanical engineers that are develop the whole uh, air conditioning system, uh, we are um, also testing our uh, dehumidification system to, to see if it's more effective than other approaches. So also that might be interesting for you. This is a, a, a project of a, of a student, a PhD student that uh, uh, finished a couple of years ago. Uh, she was working on, on a different way to produce membranes with very uniform pores. So this is not the usual way to prepare membranes, uh, 
but uh, at that kind that that time so this student was a student coming with a more physics uh, environmental and physics background and she was interested in, in working on on nanofabrication so the kind of methods that we use for electronics for the preparation of uh, um, systems in electronic where you have different layers and you use uh, um, photolithography, you use reactive etching to prepare, uh, to to have a, a structuration of these uh, materials. Usually it's not for the pre preparing pores, it's for giving a design and structuration. Uh, what she did is then to apply a combination of methods uh, used for electronic to have pores in a micrometer uh, scale. So this is more or less a representation of, it's a combination of what's a photolithography, that means etching or applying light to um, to react specifically. Uh, we, we build first a, a mask, a, a designer mask with a, a exactly pore size that we want to have, the distribution, then we apply light, we we have different layers, um, and we have a reactive etching to form the, the pores. And this she tried, she tested for different applications. One of them was for air filtration to, uh, that you could tailor the pores exactly for uh, having a very high distribution of uh, density of pores and filter um, particles of like micrometer size, which are quite uh, uh, important in, in terms of, of pollution of size of could be one micrometer or, or two, two and a half is the most common one. Good, this is for, for more uh, air and uh, dehumidification. But great part of the work that we do, uh, as I mentioned before, is to um, provide materials that could be used, could uh, uh, really change the way that separations are done in chemical and petrochemical industry. You know that Saudi Arabia, the, Saudi, Saudi Arabia is changing a lot in many ways. So it's, I have been here for 14 years now and you see the society change and you see the way that uh, uh, opportunities also for women on the on business on um, on, on education and so are changing, but still uh, the main economy in Saudi Arabia is oil. Uh, although they are changing also in the last four years, uh, the investment on changing the economy to diversify and become um, renewable. Uh, and really with a lot of concern on, on the environment. So this is it's real. It's not uh, only uh, uh, this, uh, like a blah, blah, blah. It's, it's really, really, really changing that. But we still have a lot of petrochemical industry, very strong one, uh, probably the, the largest in the world and the chemical industry. So how can we contribute for making this industry cleaner and more effective and with less uh, CO2 production and with less energy consumption. So we can work, develop membranes again, uh, because membranes can separate without excessive heating. I think we, uh, and we can uh, make it more effective. And also if we diversify the methods that we use for separation, we can make possible separations that are not um, not possible today. So like you can just not heat some pharmaceutical products that are, will degrade by heat. So you need to separate, if you need to concentrate and if you need to separate then you need to find a way that will not uh, involve uh, like just solvent evaporation. So membranes, the same membrane that is used for desalination, but if you change the, the, the material, if you change a bit, they continue to be a multi-layer membrane, not, now, not the hollow fiber that I show you, but 
many of them are flat sheet uh, with different layers. You see here on the left side, uh, a selective coating, which usually is very thin, not to, to compromise the, the, how fast the transport is. But then you have a, a, a porous layer, which with pores which are go down to to less than a micrometer sometimes, uh, so for sure less than a micrometer, sometimes even one nanometer on the top. This is usually a gradient. Uh, and the way to prepare that is uh, um, in the industry and also in our lab, we use a machine like that. You have a support, uh, it's a textile that is uh, where you coat, you deposit a, a solution of a polymer and then this is uh, goes into water, so a bath of water. When it goes to water, water is, is a non-solvent for this polymer and it coagulates, but it coagulates forming a quite complex um, structure of pores, a gradient of pores. And this is the way that is done in the industry as well. So what we do, it's, uh, it's very convenient because we can just by changing the the polymer by changing the conditions, the concentrations, everything, we can change quite a lot the structure of the membrane and the uh, stability and, and the capability of separation. And then we take this membrane and then we apply another final coating that will give you the, the separation. So where can we use that? So I think in chemical industry, as I mentioned, it's much more challenging than using for desalination because it needs to be, it requires more stability. It requires uh, um, uh, separations that are, uh, so in the case of desalination, you take water out and everything else is retained. So what we want in the chemical or petrochemical or, or pharmaceutical industry, we want to separate products that are much more similar, sometimes uh, have the same uh, polarity, but uh, a little bit different in size, or uh, they are similar in size, but they have a little bit different um, polarity. So in this case, we have been uh, working also on, on oil fraction fractionation, not to completely substitute this uh, distillation, but to take part of the process to, to separate at least, uh, let's say you filter the light uh, components of an oil, crude oil, and then you can save energy with that. Uh, and this is, is the one goal that only, not only my group, but uh, groups like uh, in the UK, uh, groups of Andrew Livingstone or in the US uh, working with uh, different uh, companies. Uh, of course, we want to to be completely out of fossil fuels, but until we get there, it would be important to have some alternatives with more effective, more uh, with less energy. So again, we need polymers which are very stable, uh, insolvent, and sometimes you have to heat part of it. So we have been quite happy or with with a polymer we synthesize in our group, which is a its name is polytriazole. It's this structure that we see on the right side. So it's a very aromatic, that means so very a lot of these uh, benzene rings here that makes it quite stable the, the polymer. And and we uh, this this is the structure on the right side that comes out of that machine that I showed before. So you have a quite uh, complex porous structure. But you see that on the top, here's a cross section. When you see on the top here, is a thin layer that forms automatically. Uh, but uh, it sometimes, or most of the times, is not the final structure that you need. So you need to, uh, this is, this in this case here, is almost as selective as we wanted but uh, we need to cross-link. So in cross-link, it's better to do it without additional solvents uh, in a simple way, just by some thermal treatment. And we found out that we could do that and have a, something that is very, uh, very stable 
uh, and uh, still permeable and, and able to, to separate uh, even crude oil in different fractions. So here, these are results of different chromatography methods that we see uh, you just filter the crude oil and then by doing in different temperatures that are not by far not the temperatures that they use in a refinery. This is a, uh, here 90, 120. So it's, and then you can separate different fractions of the oil. So this is a, it's an early stage, but it's a, a, a hope that we can really contribute, not only for the petrochemical industry. This is a extreme case because we really wanted to, to go for the most challenged task, but the same kind of membranes can be used to separate uh, products in the chemical industry, which whatever we do in terms of fossil fuels, the chemical industry will continue to exist. We will continue to have a, a production of many um, materials that could be um, medicine, could be uh, pharmaceuticals as well. So this, what I showed before is a, 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 a way that uh, is uh, without uh, adding a final coating on, on selective layer. But there's other ways that also part of the, the way that we do a desalination membrane is it's not enough to produce that gradient of pores. We need to have a very thin layer on the top that is added afterwards. Uh, and this is usually done by what we call interfacial polymerization. The principle is you have this porous structure, this uh, porous layer, you embed it with a, a, a solution, which is in water, water with some monomers, some reactants. And then you embed, so this, um, now this porous layer embedded with the uh, aqua solution, you put it in contact with a, a completely uh, immiscible solution, like a very apolar, like an oil, or like a, something that will not mix with water. And this phase will contain another reactant. So since the two phases don't mix with each other, the reaction can only take place in the interface. And uh, then the, the monomer which is in water, the monomer which is in, in, in the apolar uh, phase, will immediately react and they form a polymer. They form a, like a skin. Uh, once it react, they form the skin. So there's no further grow of this uh, layer because it's like a, a barrier in itself. So and any pinhole there will be um, closed by the reaction. So the the final um, the final result is uh, so you see here this. Uh, colorful circle here is colorful because it's an interference color. So it's a, it's just a, because it's so thin that it's a, a below the, the wavelength of light. So it's just around that. So very thin doesn't, uh, is, there's no resistance for transport, but it's selective. And this is again, it's, it's the principle of a desalination membrane, but if we change the chemistry, we can use for separations that are in the chemical industry or petrochemical. This here is a, a paper that we published last year in collaboration with the group of uh, Andrew Livingstone in Imperial College and now he moved to Queen Mary University uh, and also together with Exxon. Um, so we use then as a monomer, instead of using the classical monomers, which is very hydrophilic for desalination, we use monomers which are very apolar. So you see, could be like a fluorinated one, but I think fluorinated, we all uh, now tend to go out of it. So there are monomers which are completely only carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen. They are also very apolar. Uh, and then we build like a block copolymer, segments of this, uh, Hydro, uh, this apolar um, material, and also segments which have a, a reactive group. So reactive groups are 
amino groups, for instance. So we prepare this uh, um, interfacial polymerization. And before that, we have a kind of self-assembly uh, where you have uh, uh, vesicles formed uh, in, in the aqua solution. And these will be integrated in the selective layer as well. So these are the channels that will uh, favor the transport of uh, oil through, through the uh, membrane because they are very apolar. So at the end, it looks like that. So you see, uh, this is the thin layer, a selective layer. You have these uh, bumps, which are uh, the, the, the surface of the, the, th of the channels. This is where preferentially the, uh, some fractions of oil will go through. And like the final result and testing, you see the first we test with epitane, uh, which is also very uh, simple um, permeant, but there's a very apolar one. And you see, depending on the membrane that we use or depending on the composition that we use, compared also with a series of other ones, uh, the, the, the X here, X is the, what is the, the smallest size of a, a of a permeant that this membrane allows to flow through. So you, you want something that's very permeable and you want something that will be selective for different uh, size. So this circle or this ellipse here is showing uh, good results of, of the, the membranes that we prepare, which are very permeable and they have a, a very selective for 400 grams per mole. Uh, here if we test with a series of complex mixture feed uh, um, in the membrane and you see how they are separated. So they are some will permeate because they are uh, uh, they will pass through the membranes. It's more on the top here. Some will be retained by the membrane. Good. This uh, slides that I showed before, they are uh, the intention was a uh, uh, petrochemical industry. Um, but there are many other challenges in, in chemical industry um, and many other needs for uh, materials which are very resistant. So it's in membrane technology is a, like a, it's a competition of, uh, of requirements because you need something, if you work with chemical industry, you need a, a membrane that at the end will not dissolve with the uh, chemicals that you are working with, but uh, at the same time, the preparation of the membrane, most of them, uh, except by this nanofabrication that I show you that this is a small scale fabrication, um, all the industrial membranes, they are based on, on, on solution. So you have to dissolve the polymer. You have to dissolve, but then when it's ready, you, you, you cannot dissolve anymore. So Polyether ketone or polyether ether ketone is a polymer which is very stable, but it's uh, difficult to process because, again, it's difficult to solubilize. So it dissolves in acids, strong acids, but then you don't want to use in the machine which is stainless steel because after long, long uh, use, the, you can corrode the machine. So we work together with a group of Professor Matthias Wesselin in, in Germany. They dis develop different uh, kinds of spinnerets for in plastic spinnerets uh, that can be used then for preparation of hollow fibers. And with that, we could tailor different different hollow fibers. Uh, this is a way to 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 use uh, polyether ketone, but other ways is to to have a cycle. It's a can we can call it that can. Um, chemistry, circular chemistry, because we we take a polymer which is not soluble, we modify a bit with some chemical modification um, that makes you, it soluble. We prepare fibers and membranes out of that. So usually the typical modification is to add something that is a little bit more bulky, so that will be more soluble. And then we prepare, we have the membrane, we have the fibers or the, the flat sheet, and then we immerse these uh, fibers in a, a solvent or in a, uh, that, that will uh, 
then react, recover the original structure. And this has been has worked very well in, in, in our group. So you can prepare in different forms uh, using uh, different solution process, but that the final product is very stable. So other um, other kinds of uh, of um, um, uh, of uh, membranes approach that we are using now is um, let me see this one um, again if we target the pharmaceutical industry so then we need membranes which are much more selective than what we have today because you want to separate uh, sometimes molecules that are different just by very small uh, different in size or they have a uh, 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 functionality which is just a, a minor difference sometimes even um, like a, a chiral product which are almost the same chemical structure so what we have been doing is uh, using this interfacial polymerization but now with the monomers that itself looks like a pore. So if we can cross-link then, highly cross-linked, but start with a, a cyclic uh, monomers like this cyclodextrin or uh, this one is triangular and mine. And so they, uh, they have already the size that we want to as a pore. So we just need to take them and completely cross-linked to form the membrane. And we are trying different uh, monomers, different. This is in, done also in collaboration with other groups at CAO, so like, like Nidin Kashab, who are more uh, producing, their they are, uh, focus is on, on different organic uh, uh, structures. So you could, in, in principle, you could just add that, as it's a lot of, many groups do just uh, add to, to a, a, a matrix of polymer that are uh, with the expectation that will be a, a, a like a free volume or a build a path for um, specific permeants. Uh, but we believe that the only way to do that in a effective way and selective and is uh, to cross link there is that we want to do. So these two, Monomers here. The, 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 we took a cyclodextrin, which is a polysaccharide, which is a, is a natural product as well. So we modified with amino groups and we use as a monomer for the interface polymerization and react in the same way that we react in a desalination membrane. So with that, we can even separate um, like these two molecules here on, on the right side, which are methylene blue and safranin which are very similar in size, but one is more linear, the other is more hooky. Or uh, this other example here, some is a branched one, the other one is completely linear, but the same size. We use also this other structure here, which is a triangular mine, more or less the same size of a cavity, uh, but a bit different form so that we can uh, address all the separations. And, and we test, so you see here in this slide here, we you see the, um, this is a modeling of, the blue is uh, what is the free volume in this layer, the selective layer. Uh, you see that uh, we had, a, we compare the same chemistry, one with a, the form of a triangle, so this, the triangular mine, and the other one is using the same chemistry, but not cyclic. So we random cross-linked. And we see that if we don't use the cycle, uh, we have a much more open membrane, which is not as selective anymore. Uh, the, the cyclic one will give you a very rigid and uh, effective separation. We are trying different uh, new chemistries, new like cages, uh, more complex one, uh, that could itself drive to a channel formation. Uh, but okay, you always gain in some aspects in more uh, preform uh, structure, uh, but as you grow in the complexity, 
the scalability might be an issue as well. It's always uh, how to find uh, the best option. And here, one of the ideas that a uh, postdoc had, which by the way is in Australia now, uh, he uh, wanted to introduce, and he did introduce a catalyst. So in very small particles of catalyst, he grew catalyst inside this cage and then used the case for a selective layer and catalytic layer in a membrane. Have reached the, both, both the separation and the transformation of uh, products in, in a chemical industry. So again, I will not go much in detail, but it's again, the kind of, if you change the cage, you change the, the free volume as well. And the permeation, permeability of, of these membranes. You see here uh, permeance of uh, uh, almost 60 or 50 uh, liters per, per square meter. This is very high volumes because very high uh, permeance because a typical interfacial polymerization membrane is even below one, the, the permeance. It's really quite effective in terms of transport uh, and uh, selectivity. So now the, 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 the last part I want you to, to talk more is about uh, uh, the sustainability of making membranes because um, the, it is, I think membrane are being used now in the last, decades, 40, 50 decades, membranes have a immense role. First, again, desalination is the best example. Uh, artificial kidney is, is a huge market, uh, but in chemical, in gas separation, in, in the industry, this, this is uh, in part is, is a, in, in some, prod, some processes is already there. But uh, um, the the problem that comes now is the the fabrication of the membrane itself is um, not completely sustainable because again is a solution process solution in terms of it uses a lot of solvents which are toxic which are um, which requires energy to be produced that requires uh, energy to recycle um, to purify so. Practically, so with a few exceptions, the membrane industry works with a huge amount of uh, dimethylformamide or, or similar solvents. So what can we do? And, and this important is from the, of course, first, because it is a, a, a energy that needs to be saved, but uh, also because now, in, in at least in, in Europe, they are uh, new policies are coming and and they will be forced to to change. There are many solvents that are not accepted anymore. So you see these slides here. So there's a classification in terms of uh, of undesirable or or uh, and less toxic solvents or non toxic solvents, and uh, some of of them uh, the undesirable one. Uh, they are on the process of being banned from from use, or or at least being highly controlled in a way that it does is it's not uh, profitable anymore for industry to use them. Um, so in this way, um, most of the industries they are at least uh, working and looking for alternatives, and these alternatives um, have to happen soon, and they have to keep the same. Um, kind of uh, of uh, the, of products, so they don't want they want to continue to do the same things. They want to do use the membranes uh, with the same performance, with the same efficiency. But uh, for the 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 previous one, like dimethyl formamide, and so has been optimized for decades. So they need now suddenly to change the new ones. That's the motivation of. Uh, uh, people like in our group to work and test different solvents. So, and not only the solvent itself, but uh, okay, we work with uh, polymers, with plastics. So, so this is uh, uh, what we you hear in the news are uh, the, the bad guys. <laughs> so, but you cannot live without them anymore. So, but uh, at least you can find alternatives for some application. 
So you can use uh, cellulose. So some of the first membranes uh, in the market were, were cellulose derivatives. So maybe we can take some of them and, and modify to to use in, in the process that we use today. Uh, so that's how we have been using cellulose. And cellulose, the problem with cellulose itself is that it's hard to dissolve again. We exploring different solvents. We are using lignin, which is very abundant uh, material, but very difficult to, to, to work with, very complex one, so and also difficult to dissolve. We're using um, natural products or, or uh, what we call dipiotetic product, uh, solvents, urea and propionic acid. Uh, we are looking for uh, alternative solvents for polyolefins, which are also very difficult to dissolve. But we found already some, like pinene and limonene, which is surprising at first, uh, but we could could uh, succeed with that. Or uh, we need to recycle. We need to take uh, plastics so that otherwise will be just uh, discard, and we are using for um, for preparing membranes out of that. So everything has to be very careful uh, discussed because uh, you might find technically a solution, but the the whole life cycle analysis has to be uh, okay. Now has to be uh, considered. So in summary, I, I show you different examples where membrane technology can be used and can be um, contribute for a more sustainable world. Uh, as if it is for dehumidification, uh, indoors uh, um, air quality, or, or um, organic solvent nanofiltration, which are um, used for in the chemical industry and in petrochemicals, um, or the fabrication of a membrane itself that has to be more more sustainable. But everything has to be simple, scalable, sustainable cheap. <laughs> so that's uh, uh, the challenge that we face. Uh, I will not have time to show today, but we have just, we are working also on, on new methods of characterization of membranes, uh, the porous materials, which just have a paper that came out a couple of weeks ago using synchrotron source, but, but we can discuss if you, we have time. We are organizing a, a, a conference on membranes on organic solvent nanofiltration membrane uh, next year in March. So if you are in the field, if you uh, are interested in, in coming to CAOS, uh, please contact me, con contact uh, George Sekeli, who is the co-chair, and we'll be happy to welcome here. Um, my final message is, if we look again to the report that came out this year, the model, the models, they are different models, they are different scenarios, they are uh, depending on what we can do. So uh, some will be, could be effective, but the time is, is running out <laughs> and the, the reaching what was uh, the target of 1.5 uh, degrees is almost running out of possibilities, but, uh, even if we get a bit uh, over that, we can still do a lot. But if we don't do, the the perspective is is not nice. Maybe not for me, but for my kids or for my uh, for generations that will come. And the the what I really would like to emphasize is we have to be very careful in where we. Uh, invest and not to restrict to what is maybe sometimes a hype uh, of an, an easy easier to do. Uh, all options that we have are complex and are not simple, but uh, we should not focus on just one. We should not focus only on carbon capture, which is the what is most visible on the news. We have other options, and we need which are more effective and cheaper maybe. Uh, we need to act in different ways, uh, in different methods, in different approaches. And don't forget that maybe the one that is more um, uh, visible in the news 
might not be the most effective one. Not that it should not be done, but should be just one of many. And with that, I just want to show you my group, which is a quite uh, international group, quite diverse group uh, uh, with many girls and, and, and boys <laughs> on and uh, coming from, I think, more than, more than, for sure, more than 10 countries and uh, different countries. And thank you very much. And I'll be happy to discuss and ask any questions. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Susanna. This was absolutely fascinating. I realized listening to your short presentation, we were limited uh, in the duration of presentation than in Paris. I realized that it had so much applications in our field, but now I can see this even more. Something else which I realized, you know, I was uh, invited um, in uh, August uh, to a, a school, summer school, physics of mixing. And I remember when I first uh, received this invitation, I thought, what does this have to, to do with me? And only then when I started thinking, I said, well, everything, uh, it is mixing, whatever we're doing, whatever field, it's mixing. But now listen to your presentation, I realized that, that separation is something which is the same. So, well, what's mixing, we want to separate. And these are just two integral parts of the whole system with which we are dealing. Sometimes we want to mix, sometimes we don't. We want to separate things and the methods of separation or prevention of mixing. So this, this is absolutely fascinating. I like um, the message that um, I call it now um, triple S, simple, scalable, and sustainable. Mm -hmm. This is basically what when we are thinking about the methods, what are we going to do, particularly in the future design of future buildings. We will need to change the way we, we are designing buildings to um, provide good clean air quality. There's no way around this. But doing this in a, in a way that is simple, scalable and sustainable, that's absolutely essential. Mm. So these are sort of general messages. And then uh, specific, when you talk about the application of this to um, a humidification or dehumidification. Now, you would say that in some parts of the world, Australia is one part of the world where this is critical. And what I always hear from our building engineers is the issue that interplay between temperature and humidity. And therefore you can never, or very often you can, particularly in summer, when we uh, reach here January, when it's hot and humid, and that how to, um, that um, thermal comfort, that both are uh, at the level which is acceptable, very often in the building, modern buildings, that's not possible because of that interplay of humidity. So this kind of membranes, which would help with this process, I can see that this would be extremely useful here. And if we go more um, north from here, when the climate is even more humid, then it certainly would be uh, very uh, important. And I was also thinking about the um, membrane separation and how it could be um, a used potentially, I don't know, in future building materials or even something like windows. I don't know whether they could be transparent. I was thinking about this in a situation like we had today. Um, there was in the morning was a lot of smoke in the air. Concentration was, there, there were fires. We are now reaching very, very hot um, summer and it's already starting lots of fires. So concentration outside was very high, but here in the in this building, the concentration was 50 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, mm. Where it was go, whether it was going through the filters, whether it was going through the building envelope, I don't know. But we will have more and more of this kind of problems everywhere where fires can burn. So um, uh, applications to this kind of things. And I can keep going, but mindful of time, um, and I'm, I, 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 I'm sorry that we can't see people. I think we have to do in the future something with the system. It's, it's supposed to be novel without seeing people. But uh, we have uh, two questions here. So the first is Sui. Um, could you please advise on the duration of continuous operation of the membrane? Um, as some membranes may degrade over time, especially when exposed to harsh conditions. Yeah, yeah, this is a, it's of course very important, but they are much more stable than 
than the industry would like. So I think they are, uh, mm, yes, is yes, uh, is um, I at least two years, but uh, in most times eight years or so. It's a uh, is quite stable. So it's a uh, uh, is in terms of the chemistry itself is quite stable. Um, I'm saying it of course varies from the kind of application. Uh, in, in in desalination also they, they are quite stable uh in chemical industry also uh, depending on the, the applications that i know that are used uh, already implemented is several years i know my my i have a very good interaction with one company in germany which actually my husband is one of the founders uh, uh, and they use for 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 chemical industry nanofiltration gas is quite stable. It takes long for for changing the, the module. That's true. Yeah. Okay. And then Henry, who is on the other side of this wall from me in the other room. A great presentation. Is it possible to use these materials and membranes to selectively remove certain gases? That's what I was thinking as well, such as CO2 and nitrate oxide from indoor air. Yes. Uh, it is uh, gas separation is is one of the large uh, applications of of membranes. Uh, CO two separation is is done. Uh, there is so this this company that I mentioned is the company's name is GMT uh, Membrane Technique in in the south of Germany. They use a, a lot for for gas and vapor separation in in chemical industries like uh, recovering um, monomers, uh, but also CO two separation also there. Uh, another company in in US, uh, uh, MTR, is their main business is CO two separation. Uh, of course, there are other gases which are more niche application, but yes, this is something that that's what we're thinking about indoor air and working mm -hmm. on this. This is something which we uh, well consider all all the time. Uh, my thoughts were also in terms of barriers so barriers between people let's say we are sitting between each uh, sitting facing each other mm -hmm. uh, so there's no matter what is the flow direction what's the ventilation system there's flow between us mm -hmm. uh, if there could be something which has without introducing any noise anything else could separate what's coming between us that's i don't know whether this makes sense or not but mm -hmm. thoughts i have like this as well yeah okay uh, so I work more with uh, with the permeable membrane, but it's the other uh, the other side of the story is uh, as a uh, uh, like for packaging or so that it has to be completely uh, impermeable. No, uh, so that's uh, more a dense film. So, but uh, well, no, what I'm thinking is permeable because let's say if, if we are air should go through this, so it should be. Okay. I'm not talking about barrier, like complete yeah. barrier, but something which which doesn't obstruct airflow, but which helps yeah. separation. This is what we do. I think the main, um, let's say, challenge, but it has to do just to be rethinked in in a different ways. It's not transparent. Most of the membrane because they have pores which are in the they are in the size of the the light uh, wavelength of light. So that means they scatter light. Uh, most of them. So there's at least um, turbid or so, but uh, yeah, it's something to think about. It's the, the only one that is transparent is the one that with nanofabrication that I show you, because all pores are the same size. Well, this this is, as I said, in my mind, this is just an endless application, what, what we could do. Uh, in the, at the end of uh, October, we'll have a forum which will be conducted face-to-face -face in Brisbane. There will be a Zoom access to, to this as well. And this will be, we'll be talking about future buildings. And that future mm -hmm. buildings, then the main focus of the future buildings is the the, vent, the type of uh, ventilation, the airflow, because right now the airflow and mixing is the biggest problem, mm -hmm. that mixing which is supporting infection transmission. So if we have, uh, if we stop mixing and we have different airflow, independently what the users do, this would be um, lowering. But then the issue came about filtration, how to filter air from outside, all kinds of system, uh, questions like this. 
Uh, so uh, we would like to invite you to join this. Your time, the time may not be convenient because it's in the morning in Melbourne, so it will be, well, still in the night, but it, it will be recorded. So um, it, this potentially could give you inspiration of what we could do together, how we could um, think about future designs for these future buildings. That would be really great. Yeah, it would be very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, being mindful of time, I um, think it's uh, stopping raining. Finally, we had a rain after a month uh, without raining, and, and I think people are going home now. <laughs> so thank you very much, Susanna. It was absolutely great, big privilege to have you, and I'm really looking forward to working together on this um, huge, uh, amazing ideas. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye-bye.